Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody. Today we're going to start Chapter 4, The Quantum Mechanics of Angular Momentum. Okay, this is a fascinating topic. It tends to, it uses everything we've done essentially in the course so far. It's three-dimensional, so it's our first um, foray into three-dimensional quantum mechanics. So when I first learned this quantum theory of angular momentum, I had some difficulties and I was um, really aided by a set of notes by Robert Littlejohn, a professor of physics at uh, University of California at Berkeley, and I follow his exposition pretty closely. Now he's a physicist, so he tends to use the uh, the uh, term Hermitian rather than self-adjoint. I told you you would have to get used to that, uh, the difference between the two. If you read different books, you're going to come across um, different authors use the different terms. I included a um, reference earlier on that talked about the difference between and it between these two. For finite dimensions, there's no difference. Hermitian and self-adjoint are the same thing. There are technical difficulties that can occur in infinite dimensions. We won't ever meet them, but if you really want to get to the bottom of it and learn about it, you can go back and look at that reference. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with classical mechanics. We're going to develop... Oh yeah, I should mention that I've provided a link to Little John's notes in case you want to uh, read them. There's a lot more additional information on angular moment, momentum and other things, and I would urge you to have a look at them. It really is an excellent exposition. I think it's better than any textbook I've seen. Okay, so we're going to start by introducing classical angular momentum, and then we're going to look at how we use that to develop quantum mechanical angular momentum. So we're going to develop permission or self-adjoint operators for the angular momentum. And there'll be three of them for each component. And then we're going to look at the properties and commutation relations and so on. Okay, so angular momentum of a point of constant mass m about the origin you always have to say angular momentum about which particular point is given by this expression. X is a position vector from the origin to the particle. This is the vector cross product. These are three-dimensional vectors. And P is the linear momentum. And this is often called the orbital angular momentum. And that's significant because there will be different type of angular momentum. And we'll discuss that once we get to it. Okay, so the position vector has three components. The momentum vector has three components. Everyone has their favorite way of working out the cross product. And it has three components. And it's easy to make a mistake with indices, but uh, if you practice this enough, it's no problem. So what we want to do is introduce a notation that helps us in the bookkeeping and actually helps us with the calculations that we're going to need to do. So this is the levi civita symbol. Sometimes it's called the permutation symbol or the anti-symmetric symbol or alternating symbol. So it's either 1, minus 1, or 0. It's denoted epsilon sub ijk, three indices, where we're going to be working in three dimensions. And it's 1 if ijk order is important. are an even permutation of 1, 2, 3. It's minus 1 if ijk is an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3. And these are the three possibilities. And it's 0 if any two indices are repeated. Now, using this terminal, this notation, we can rewrite the three components of angular momentum in this form. 
well, how do you know that this notation really encodes angular momentum? So the first time I learned this, and I encourage you to, write out completely the components for L1, L2, and L3 using this definition for epsilon ijk And I did this for L, L sub i in this particular case. And then you put together all the possible combinations. And for each i, one, two, three, you go back to whether it's an even or an odd permutation or repeated. And you can see that you get the three components of angular momentum that you may be familiar with, you should be familiar with. Okay, so I like to always write these things out. I mean, you can stare at them and you can try to internalize them, but when, once I write it all out, I can work, work backwards and understand it. Okay, so now we know that this levi civita symbol encodes the angular momentum in the sense that it's a shorthand for writing out the different components. Now before we had, you know, sum over j, sum over k, two different summation symbols. Sometimes when you have two different sum, sum, summation symbols, and I've done this so far in the course, you just lump the two together, sum and sub uh, with, a, with both symbols, j and k underneath it. But really, if you stare at this, you're summing over the repeated indices. Look, epsilon sub i, the first index in the levi civita symbol, is the index denoting the component of, the, of angular momentum that you're computing. And then the next two, j, k, are the two indices for what you're summing over. So you could just get rid of those sums and say, okay, I know that any time I have repeated indices, I'm going to sum over them. And that should be pretty straightforward. And that's, that's the notation we're going to, to um, use. We're not going to drag around all these summation signs. It's, this is often referred to as the Einstein summation convention. And it's very helpful. So what do we, how are we going to get the um, quantum mechanical version of orbital angular momentum? Hopefully you can guess by now what, what we're doing in this course. Okay. For the position variables, we're going to replace them by the Hermitian or self-adjoint position operators. And for the momentum variables, we're going to replace them by the corresponding quantum mechanical operators, uppercase for quantum mechanical op for operators and lowercase for coordinates. Okay, and that leads us to our definition for quantum mechanical orbital angular momentum. The same three components, but the X's and P's are now what? They're now the co corresponding quantum mechanical operators. And when we develop the position of momentum operators earlier on, in, we develop them in three dimensions also. So you can look back and see that. So it's just the obvious multiplication by the, by the corresponding coordinate for position and h bar over i d by d x i for p i, i equal one, two, three. Okay, well, we can write these as in this shorthand notation, the Levi using the Levi-Civita symbol, 
and the Einstein summation condition, and these are the three components of quantum mechanical orbital angular momentum. Now, all sorts of interesting things we need to do. We need to show that these are Hermitian or self adjoint, and we'll do that next. And we need to uh, look at commutation relations. And if you stare at this, you can see that this is the commutation relations for this are going to be interesting because we have x's and p's, xi's, pj's, sorry, xj, pk, keeping my notation right, in um, combinations. And they don't commute all the time. If, they, if, if j and k are different, they do. But I'll come to that a little bit. And we're going to get a lot of interesting commutation relations. And uh, Okay, I won't spoil things now. It's a good time to quit. And with the um, quantum mechanical orbital angular momentum operators defined in this way, which we built up from the classical mechanics, we will then derive their quantum mechanical properties starting next time. Okay, bye everybody.